My name is Nikolai Yosotis, and I want to talk a little bit about C++. Um, you might have heard my name. I've written a couple of books, and I'm involved into C standardization since the first standard, so for more than 20 years now. So it's all my fault. <laughs> and um, when we talk about C++, I have a problem. I'm not the smartest guy, um, that's why I write books, so I have a book where I can find out details. And um, C++ gets more and more complicated. And this is a story about why and how things sometimes go worse when we think they go better. And how we should deal with that. So this is, talk, this is a talk about initialization. And um, initialization is a topic uh, we had since the beginning, in fact, we had it even before the beginning of C++. We started with C because we are backward compatible with C and we had in this, uh, initialization rules adopted from C. So we adopted that in just an int that is declared has on the stack has uninitialized value and we had adopted the usual way to initialize an int is an equal sign, which is not an assignment operator. And um, the way, well, the way when we have aggregates or structures or arrays to initialize a value was using an equal sign and um, curly braces. So we adopted these rules and we introduced classes and classes became, got a new syntax and the syntax was using parentheses because we had to support multiple parameters. Um, so let's introduce something new, parentheses. And um, it turned out that we adopted this syntax for the existing fundamental data types, so we did, could use them to initialize an int in uh, different ways, um, either directly or by with the expression type and then the empty parenthesis to create an int and guarantee default or guarantee an initialized value there, which is especially important for templates. And then we had, um, okay, the problem that the containers we couldn't initialize. So that was roughly the situation when we thought we have to do something with this. Oh, let's make it better. And one thing we should make better is to harmonize things because oh, everything I, you see on the slide could be a type there. And if you see a type x, y, and you don't know whether it's a fundamental data type or whether it's an aggregate or whether it's a class, you have no clue how to initialize it, um, unless you know the details. So, um, we have another problem with this uh, existing category. We have um, different ways to initialize, different terminology, and different rules. So, everything, every little piece was a little bit different, and therefore we introduced about um, seven primary terms about initialization in the standard. I don't explain them here. So different rules, different terms, um, different syntaxes. Let's make it uniform, but of course we have to be backward compatible. So the decision was to take the curly braces as uniform way to initialize. Which means, of course, being backward compatible, we exist the existing ways to initialize an in and we got a couple of new ways to initialize an int. So direct initialization with or without a value and copy initialization, which is a name for initialization with an equal sign, um, which uh, again um, might have a value or not. Um, is that all we introduced with C++11? No, we introduced even more. We, for example, introduced a way to say, um, oh, by the way, first of all, let's discuss that we um, also introduced this uh, syntax for all the areas we had. So in all the areas we had, uh, whether we had aggregates or whether we have fundamental data types or whether we had classes, we are now allowed to use curly braces with and without the equal sign. And of course, we are backward compatible. And this also applies to containers now we have introduced a technology to say we can introduce, we can initialize a vector 
by a certain number of values um, which are literals or which are uh, non-literals. Good, and the way this helped is uh, we could, instead of creating a multi-map, uh, the way that we insert make pair, uh, make pairs, uh, we could just declare what we want to have here. Good. So that's the story. How many ways do we have to initialize an int? Well, we certainly have these four, which we got from both C++ and C. Um, then we have the new ways to use curly braces. But then there's more. We also can initialize an int by using auto. Um, so that the type is also somehow deduced from the initial value. And there again, we have different syntaxes with some interesting consequences, which we have to discuss in a moment. And then, well, while I was preparing this talk, no, well, let me say it that way. While I was starting to think about this mess, I thought, well, is there even more? Oh yes, let's try out parentheses. So this, this works, but it's something different. Um, this, does this work? No, that's a compile time error. Hey, Pablo, you should know. <laughs> you are on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> so, does this compile? Well, of course, also not, you think, but yes, it compiles. Um, because this is using the comma operator to initialize the int with the nine. And does this compile? No, this is an error, of course. It's obvious, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, and the same applies if we here again replace in by auto, um, we have roughly the same rule. So I found 19 ways to initialize an int and that's probably not complete. Maybe the, the 19 naive ways to initialize an int. Good, um, well I think we agree that initializing an int with parentheses looks a little bit red on this slide. Too much corner cases, too much tricky things. We have a problem because function declarations look like that. So it was an intentional decision not to use parentheses for uniform initialization. So strike this idea. Which means, by the way, we should maybe no longer initialize an int, the int i3 with the parentheses, but let's see. This talk is not over yet. So let's concentrate on the, on the things, on the other things, on using curly braces. Um, let's look a little bit, little bit at the auto cases. So this case looks good. It does what it should, looks good. And um, we have the right value. It's intuitive, I would say, fine. How about this case? Well, when we standardize C++11, we made a significant mistake here. Yeah, we developed software. The software is called the C++ standard. And in the standard, it's like in any other software, we make mistakes, we have bug fixes, but the only problem we have, like in any other software or almost any other software, we have to be backward compatible. And that creates a lot of pressure. Well, but uh, we decided to change the semantic of this. And the initial semantic was that this is initializing an STD initializer list of an int. Well, if you ask the naive programmer, is this uh, what you think that is created here? They will probably say no, unless they know this kind of questions from C++. Okay, so we fix this, and by the way, we fix this officially in the standard in C++14 or for C++14, but we fix it in a way that it's considered to be a defect. So at a certain moment when the compilers adopt this new semantics of this thing, um, you get different behavior even in C++11 mode, which is just that you know that Clang 3.8, GCC 5, and Visual Studio 15, for example. So, this is now doing the right thing, unless you're using an old compiler. 
Good. Do we have more? Yes. How about the equal sign here? Well, we had the interesting decision that we thought, well, just for generic code, sometimes it's useful to have a syntax to initialize an STD initializer list of something. So a lot of people rejected to make this consistent here, which means an equal sign in an initialization can change the type of the thing you initialize. This is a nightmare. This is a real nightmare. I asked this three months ago again on our reflectors, hey guys, are we ready to change that? No, we are not. So I thought, I simply asked, are we all agree that this is not the right thing? No, we don't not all agree. No, we, what is this double, double <laughs> negation? No, okay, yeah. You know what I mean. Okay. So yes, this will probably remain to be the case until we fix this, really, we really fix this. And the intention is probably, and we discussed this a little bit further, um, the, the intention is that we will not, not modify the semantics of this. We will disable this at all. And, there, and that's, prob that's my thought about the likeliness of how this will become fixed. And uh, we, until we get something like this, so if we have something like to be the ability to clear an initializer list of auto, so that, that the uh, that the type that this can be part of a template that the type of the elements gets deduced from the thing on the right and by the way uh, we might at the same time uh, be able to declare an array of auto here that way and the roughly idea is that the moment we have that we no longer need i11 support so um, we have too much code with that so let's uh, just turn it off Probably also because we can't agree on what is the usual other reaction. So this will probably become an error on C plus plus twenty three, but you never know. You never know. Good. So I think we might have a consensus already, but if not, we will probably have consensus that initializing with auto and the equal sign and curly braces is a combination you shouldn't use. Probably not even now. So is, does it mean, well, looking for a common pattern that we have learned something from this? You know, I'm giving a couple of trainings to beginners this year for whatever reason. They suddenly want to learn C++ again or whatsoever. And um, I have to decide what to teach in these trainings. I have to decide whether which one of these 11 or now nine ways to initialize an int is the right way to start with for the ordinary beginner, for the naive programmer. So maybe the fact that I11 is not working probably is enough reason to say the, the rule becomes too complicated if you use an equal sign. Don't initialize with an equal sign. It's better with that. Maybe, maybe. Because we have other opinions and other things going on. And there was a first part of initializing with auto, which looked like this. And where does this come from? It came from the idea that we can almost always use auto. It was an idea Herb Sutter brought up in 2013 in one of his um, week, uh, columns, um, Guru of the Week um, uh, blocks. No, oh, that year we didn't have the term blocks, did we? No, probably not. Um, and the roughly idea was um, after we found out already there that Initialization is a mess. Do we have better rules than now or than five years ago? And the rough idea, let's make it very consistent. Let's make it whatever you declare something, whether it's a type or an object, you start with some general term like auto for objects and um, using for types. Then comes the name 
and then comes something that initializes the value. Good. So um, there were some rules in this, um, I say block. <laughs> um, usually just use get, give us an initial value and if that's not appropriate, if you need something else, you might give a type in front. So that you see the four examples on the bottom that they get converted to the thing on the right. Is this uh, without any problem? I hear a couple of hype about that. Um, whenever we, we introduce a new term, especially if it sounds that well, triple A, we all know triple A, at least in the States, it has a special meaning here. Um, you think this is a good rule because it sounds simple and simple simplicity is really what we need. At the same time, you should be careful because you know there can't be anything simple in C++. <laughs> so let's look into this. And by the way, I should comment, uh, help ask me that or explain that to me, that one good thing of this semantic is you can't forget to initialize if you have this rule. Because if you don't have an initial value, this will not compile. Good. So we have the examples I just introduced. We have it. And now let's look into some other cases, some corner cases with this syntax. The first corner case is using equals and curly braces. Like here on the left. We had that already. That was a problem with the solution that we thought this is an initializer list. So we need the other way, the bottom line here that is initializing the I. Another problem is what happens with user defined types like std string? And then we have string virtuals. Um, how do we write that? Well, um, the, the proposal was, well, let's use the S suffix, which we have uh, defined as a little operator or via the little operator since C++ 14. Unfortunately, that doesn't work in practice. It's almost never used because we forget a little detail it should always be possible to do this, which isn't. You need a declaration like using namespace as to the locals. And I think it's time, it's time now to make this suffix globally available. So one of the features where we say this is no longer a library feature in STD, it should be globally available. One argument against that was that we will probably sooner or later get STD2 and then we get some conflicts, but this discussion is over. With the adoption of uh, concepts in C++17, that was the biggest, biggest and most dangerous features we've talked about, which would be a reason to introduce something like a new standard namespace. It turned out in practice when we discussed the details that we get a chaos, a fundamental chaos, when we for that introduce a new namespace. De facto, we would have to add a new namespace for each and every new library feature that comes with something new that breaks existing behavior. Um, uh, to make this work, we um, would, or we would have to be conflict-free, but if we are conflict-free among the different standard namespaces, we don't need the second namespace. So SCD2 is gone. Trust me. Well, trust nobody that talks about C++. <laughs> Good. So hopefully we might fix that. We haven't done that. Then we have the problem that this way of initialization only works for types that are copyable or movable. So this would not work for atomic that was, this would not work for LuckGuard and other types that are neither copy nor movable. And we have another similar problem here. Sometimes, for sometimes, this using this is expensive because we have no cheap move support, although the operation is expensive. And the example is STD array. STD array can't be moved because the, all the elements are on the stack. 
So all the elements have to be initialized to be copied from the right side to the left side. So the good news is this is fixed. We fix that in C++ 17 and with C++ 17 because both here now the the initialization of A with auto will now compile and the initialization of R with this syntax is now a fast initialization because, because it's guaranteed that there is no copy called at all. Why that? We introduced the rule that for any type, even if no copying and no moving is supported, um, the following is now still possible which was, this hasn't been before. If you pass an argument by value, which is a temporary object, or for the experts, a PR value, this is not guaranteed not to become a copy or a move. In the past, the compilers had the freedom to optimize things away here, but now they are required to do so. And because they are required to do so, we can guarantee that this works, even if no copy or move constructor is defined. Copy and move constructors is not defined. Um, the same is true for return values. So if we return a temporary, a temporary object, it's no longer necessary that the data type has to, has to support copying or moving. This only applies to the non unnamed return value optimization, not to the named return value optimization. There you still need something because the name return value optimization uses L values or something similar. And um, you can then initialize the whole thing and pass it to an um, object as an initialization. And, and look at this, when we create, or we, when we in bar have this return statement, the new mental model of C++ is that this does not create an object. This creates an initial value. And this initial value is passed as return type and used to initialize x. And there we have for the first time an object with the location in the program where you, where you can take the address from. So even if you take the return value and pass it to foo because you pass it by foo, you still, to foo, you still haven't created an object until you get to the moment where inside foo the parameter is declared. And when you have something like uh, I want to use the return value by reference, this is an interesting case because for the moment until bar returns something, we have no created object here, but the moment we need here a location for this initial value, this object, this return value becomes materialized. And by the way, I should use the new syntax of course here and not the old syntax here, but that's something we discuss right now. So what happens here is we return a temporary object and because we need its location, because for example we need a reference or a pointer, we materialize the object. This is a new mental model for the value category since C++ 17. The mental model has not changed the terminology. So we still have L value, X value, and PR value on the lower level. Each expression is one of this. Um, GL value and R value as common terms. We have slightly changed one when a PR value gets converted to an X value, in fact, the moment a temporary object, a PR value, needs a location, it is what we call temporary materialization conversion happens, which is a PR value, an implicit PR value to X value conversion. I hope I understood it correctly. I'm only using C++ and I asked the expert about 20 times about this. Good, so that's being said, we are, we are good now with the case of atomic and SCD array. So let's go to some other problems. If we have a type name consisting out of multiple words, this is still not supported. 
so this will not compile. So there we have an, a special case, maybe we have another type that, that, which might or might not look the same. Um, or we have to use a static cast here, let's, which gets a little bit annoying. And then we have finally the problem that if we use references, or if we want to use a returned value by reference, um, this does not work if on the left side is auto. Why that? Because auto decays. Auto follows the rules of passing by value. These rules were adopted from C, and that means um, when you have an integer i declared and you have a reference to this integer and you initialize an object declared with auto with this reference, this type of R is not the type of V. The decayed type of R is the type of uh, V. So that means V is an int and not an int reference or a constant reference. So this is a new object. And because of this rule, for example, when you initialize with auto and you take an array, this becomes a pointer, and that means that the S here, if you initialize by a um, uh, string literal, which is the type is an array of constant characters, it, this is also a, a point becoming a pointer. So this is different here. So we create a new object instead of referring to the return value. So and the solution has to be then to use auto ref or auto ref ref depending on the semantics you want to have. If you didn't understand them, yeah, they're tricky. I don't explain them here. So the question, the interesting question is, um, which I thought when I provided the slides, maybe I should always use auto ref ref here. I didn't think it through. Maybe somebody of you can do that, and but it would mean that the AAA rule changes. First of all, the almost, the first word of almost always auto came because of the atomic and array case. So the first A is gone. It's now only always auto. And, but now we might use additional references. So I proposing to rename this to the quadruple A rule. So to say this is almost auto um, and then reference, well, A, is A a reference? No, that's something different. I don't know. Ampersand, yeah, that was the reason, yeah. Sometimes I forgot my own ideas, yeah. Always auto ampersand ampersand. That's easy. You only get famous in this community if you have crazy ideas. <laughs> and you know what, next year everybody will say, oh, that's a new simple rule, Nikola Zut has taught us, we should, we should use them everywhere. <laughs> I see that coming. Don't, don't follow guidelines from experts who have crazy ideas. <laughs> Good, so what we learned is we initialize I12, um, the AAA or AAA rule or whatsoever. Um, this does not always work most of the time, but not always. Good, so now I'm here and wondering myself, what should I teach? What should I teach to beginners? Good, let's talk a little bit about the benefits of uniform initialization. Um, first of all, um, initializing, initializing with curly braces sometimes help and makes things less complicated. So the first example we had when we have using a parenthesis, this was considered to be a function, not a, to be a declaration of an object. And in template code, when we had T parenthesis, we had it to need an equal sign. And so this now becomes simpler in template code. We can write T X3 and then use empty curly braces there. And we guarantee that the object is initialized. Um, here's another example I like. If you call a hash function, you need two things. You first have to create the hash function and then you have to call it because it's a function object. And uh, the way you would do it the old way, would say you, you're calling with uh, twice with the parentheses here. The first parentheses are in fact for the being a declaration and the second parentheses are for being uh, a function call, uh, which uh, I would now be easier to distinguish 
by using, by having different syntax here. And another thing that uh, turned out uh, that I learned, I, I don't know, three, three months ago when I, when I, on the floor, discussed with uh, some other guys who are talking about adopting reflection API of C++ for C++ uh, 20 or 23, they came up with this problem and uh, they wanted to reflect on, on an expression called string with parentheses. And the interesting thing was they were discussing whether they give and how they give string with parentheses different semantics so that uh, they can express whether they reflect on the type, so I call a default constructor here, or whether they reflect um, on a construct on the constructor call on the function and the, it was funny because I was remembering my old days when I thought hey why why should we do that we saw we had this problem before so why why do you need something else if you want to reflect on the constructor call use curly braces and if we want to reflect on the type use parentheses because that was a solution I learned 20 years ago for a similar problem, 20 years ago I wrote code like this when I wrote uh, the first edition of the C++ standard library I ran into this problem. Um, I was using namespace which is important here as using namespace STD and then I was declaring I thought I was declaring an object V of type vector of in initialized by two objects that read from the input stream, so from CN, and that's the way you can do that. And it turned out that this compiled, great. But the moment I tried to use a vector, I got an incredible bad error message. Because what was happening here, I didn't declare an object, I declared v to be a function with a return type vector of int and two parameters. The first parameter had the name c int and was of type i stream operator of int and the second parameter had no name but it was a parameter for a function taking no arguments and returning an i stream iterator of int. That's obvious, isn't it? We call this the most vexing pass problem, or one of them, which means um, when we pass, we try to pass it as good as possible, and in doubt, in doubt, we interpret it that way. Uh, I'm not a core expert. I needed a couple of core experts to explain me what's, what's going hang on here. So thanks to John Spicer for this explanation 20 years ago. And uh, the solution was, that we needed an additional pair of parentheses. And you know what? If we would have had uniform initialization, the solution is easy. Uniform initialization says use braces. Braces can't be interpreted as a function call. So the problem has gone away. So what else do we have? We have another benefit, which you probably all know, the curly braces disable implicit narrowing. So when we, well, coming from C, initialize an int with 7.8, this works, this doesn't even give a warning, and you get the value of 7, then you initialize um, uh, an int with curly braces, this is detected. When you initialize an unsigned value with a maybe signed value, this uh, is okay if you use the old way to initialize whether it's the assignment operator or parenthesis um, with uh, using uniform initialization. This is detected and this also applies to vectors of int taking doubles whether as a literal or whether as a type. Um, not all compilers follow this rule. Um, so in GCC and Clang, please enable minus minus pedantic errors to get this um, feedback. Great, so because narrowing is always bad, isn't it? Uh, uh -huh. It's not that way. Look at this uh, simple example. You have a character C 
initialize with A, and I want to increment this character. So what I might do is I initialize another character with C plus one, which is narrowing, because by definition, the sum of a character and an int is an int, and using an int to a character might lose its value. So this will not compile, and in this case it might be bad. People would have to write a static class, or they use the other way of initialization we still have, thanks goodness. So the good thing is what you learn from that is it's not the case that we should say always use brace initialization. Use it maybe as a default, but for special cases, use it the other way around. And there are other examples like that. Here's another example that is pretty well known. Um, when we initialize objects, um, we can initialize them the, the old fashioned way and the initializer list way. By the way, we have some interesting terminology confusion here because what you have there on the bottom is uh, four initializer lists. But what people often mean by initializer list, they mean standard initializer list. So standard initializer list is a special way to deal with initializer list. Uh, in that way, they have to be homogeneous. So um, the first three constructors call the first uh, two constructors, the classical constructor, no, the first two, excuse me, and the last two call the last, uh, uh, the last initializer list constructor. Well, um, Wait a minute, please, please, please beware, whenever you need an STD initializer list, there have to be curly braces, otherwise it doesn't compile. So that means that the default constructor is not supported here because there is no classical um, constructor taking no arguments. So now things come, became co complicated when we did overload and had different matches. So when we said, I have an int constructor and an initializer list constructor, and the int constructor has a default value, so it can be used as a default constructor. There are rules for that. The rules are pretty simple. Without curly braces, the std initializer list can't be used. So the first three cases call the first constructor if they compile with curly braces. Well, it's a little bit more complicated if the initializer list is empty, we call the classical default constructor if it exists, and otherwise we call the other. Good, easy to remember. Shouldn't make a difference, should it? Well, sometimes it does. Um, here's an example. In the standard library, we have a vector of int declared, and you could do that in the past. And if you were not using curly braces, so that means you didn't use the initializer list constructor, we were creating a vector of three elements of value 42, and now with curly braces, we have different behavior. For some people, this is a proof that we made something wrong. For me, it's a proof, well, and what we made wrong is to introduce initializer lists. This is a proof but this is not a proof that initializer list is wrong. This is a proof that the constructor of a vector that applies to the first rule is wrong. And we should not standardize that anymore because any naive programmer would say, yeah, V2 is the thing that should happen in all these cases if it compiles. And so this is um, again a, re a, a good example that we might sometimes, because we need the first behavior use a, a, a different way of initialization, but the curly braces are self-explanatory and therefore better to teach. So how can we initialize a vector of string? Well, let's look at a vector of string um, in various cases. So the first thing doesn't compile because um, this uses the initializer list constructor. Remember the elements are strings, so it has to be convertible to a string. So uh, we have no curly braces, this will not compile. About the second case, we have to talk a little bit in a moment. Um, then we have uh, multiple elements assigned, and then we deal with additional curly braces, just for fun. 
Did you ever do that? So uh, it turned out that VO4 or VO5 are okay, VO6 is not, and VO7 is interesting. Because it's a fatal runtime error, um, the problem is um, this has not the right number of braces. Either you have to have the right number of braces roughly, or only one pair of braces. That, that's not the exact rule. I didn't understand it, asked the core guy. And um, the problem is what happens here is uh, we interpret these two parameters as iterators. So these are iterators. That means that it's the begin of the range and that the end of the range. And they, are refer they should refer to the same range of characters because characters convert implicitly to strings. This will compile. If you are lucky, you get a call down. If not, you have a big problem. So yeah, things like that happen. That's, by the way, not at the fault of the equal sign. You have the same problem without the equal. Good. So not everything works fine in both ways. Um, let's look at enumerations. Enumerations, we introduced something in C17, which is a rule saying when you have an enumeration with uh, a fixed underlying type, and then it's okay to initialize an enum with using direct list initialization, which means using curly braces and no equal sign. This is the only valid thing. Anything else will still not work. So we made S3 compile in C17 in case we either have an enum class or we have an enum with this explicitly specified underlying type. Um, if you have a classical enum, without a specified underlying type, this will still not compile. You have no way to do that without a static cast. And uh, the reason we introduced that was, for example, to support something like std byte, that we can declare an object std byte easily by having at least one signature to give it an in, uh, initial integral value. Next question, direct or copy? We have explicit. Explicit plays an impact when we initialize. It only plays an impact when we initialize with the equal sign. Without, it doesn't matter. So, but with, it does matter. So look at these initializations here for a collection. We say we don't want to have an implicit conversion from int to collection. So let's um, look at this. Without the equal sign, everything compiles. Doesn't matter whether we have explicit there or not. But with, that, with, we have to double check, is there an implicit conversion? And there is, because the thing on the right has a different type. So the constructor has to be called, and we don't explicitly specify on the right side with to which type we want to explicitly convert. So this will not compile. Um, things become interesting if you have something like this. You have a collection. And uh, you have sometimes explicit and sometimes not. So you get the following behavior that, for example, due to the rules we had, initializing with curly braces might sometimes work and might sometimes not. Because uh, without the, a value inside, according to the rules we had, the um, default constructor is called, which is not explicit. And Otherwise, the other constructor is called, which is explicit. And that also applies to initializations with equal sign. So copy initialization. Which, of course, confuses a lot of people. And uh, we made every mistake also by the standardization. So here's an, exa ex uh, here's an example which we had, which is um, class vector in C11. Look at this. Class vector has. Uh, default constructor being explicit and initializer list not being explicit. This should never happen. Make sure the default constructor and an initializer list constructor are either both explicit or none of them is explicit. This should be a very, very important style guide you have. And we fixed that because look at this. Uh, it was totally confusing for people that V3 didn't compile. And we fixed that in uh, C14. 
So we now know that here in the case V01, this will compile since C++ 14. Um, how, do we, how else do we deal with explicit in the vector? Well, look at this. We have um, here a class person. Um, if you have multiple arguments or no arguments, now explicit also matters. That means a person can be initialized and can, can be implicitly initialized by an empty curly braces or curly braces with some values inside. So uh, we have to think about whether we like that or not. And uh, we can enable this all, we can disable this all, then the programmer has to write everywhere person. Or we can partially enable things like this because the argument here is it's always critical if you not intentionally do something else than just writing a name. So it should be that you have to do something else and if it's only empty curly braces. Uh, it turns out that's, a, the, 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 that's a, the, the direction currently the standard goes. We have fixed a couple of cases or about to fix a couple of cases for that for C++20. So you have the following interesting behavior. Look at this. Uh, look at the bottom of this, um, um, the bottom group here. So we can initialize with the empty curly braces and equal sign. We can't with a single value. And uh, from time to time, we can't even with another value because we make the mistake that we both declare both constructors together because the second is a default value for the first. And then with multiple arguments, it's again already, it's again covered. And we fix that probably there's currently ongoing a task to fix, for example, V11 here, so that this would compile in C++20. I don't know whether this is improvement or not, because still we have some cases where you need the explicit uh, name and sometimes not, but that's the way it is. Okay, having said that, let's talk about aggregates which are structs or arrays um, traditionally from C, and the meaning of struct and arrays changed over time, changed over time due to different reasons. We have now a new de definition of it in C++17 for the first time we support base classes. So here's an example of what is supported right now. Data can, uh, your aggregate, DV is the aggregate here, can have a base type data and this was before a class, so um, there were this strange rule that, um, no, that was not the strange rule, that was okay, so that you could declare, initialize that, or you have, could have that uninitialized. Since C++ 17, this is an aggregate, so um, you can now do things like this, you can pass values to the base class in the initialization. Good, something when I thought about that, I learned was the following thing. If you have a deleted constructor, which means you have a user declared constructor, this was still an aggregate. This was introduced in C++11 half intentionally, I would say. Um, so this was, and, and immediately people thought, oh, this is cool. By this trick, I can force the programmer that they have to use initializations with curly braces. Uh, but it was totally unintentional. I mean, you are, I asked everybody, what does it mean? Oh, it has a deleted default constructor, so C2 should not compile. Um, we fixed that now. And we fixed that uh, uh, um, a couple of months ago, ago in the last um, meetings, and this will be fixed in C++20, having the old meaning again. We did still have some other problems. Here's another problem. If we have explicit here, and this is an aggregate, then you can still have this problem uh, that you say this aggregate default initialized, um, but uh, initializing with curly braces doesn't work. And even worse, initializing using the um, parenthesis initializer versus the curly initializer is a difference. So, with curly braces, this does not initialize. And that's the reason why template code in the standard library still uses parentheses to initial local objects and not using curly braces here. I hope we fix that soon. 
And um, yeah. So what else do we have? We have an array type, which is an aggregate. It's just a templified aggregate in C++. So we took like a C structure. We took now uh, the C structure and templified the arguments, added a few functions so that you can use it like a container. But it is not a full class or not. It, it, it is still an aggregate. So it follows different rules for initialization. So one consequence is if you declare an array without curly braces, it will be not initialized. The values will be not initialized. But there's a more interesting consequence. Think about you switch from a vector to an array. So we have a vector of complex doubles. How do you initialize that? For example, that way. If you switch to arrays, this will no longer compile. Because the way you have to do that is to use an additional pair of parentheses because this is in fact a struct with an array element inside and the array elements is, are directly in, initialized. Okay, doesn't compile is not that bad. Look at this. Let's initialize a vector of complex numbers with, a, with one element and the element has a value one, two. Let's take this code and replace vector by array. You have different semantics. Because now you have a level higher done something, which means you have not initialized the first element. You have initialized the first two elements, the first taking the one and the second taking the two. So what you have done is in fact this. So also some things that drive me crazy. Do we have other issues? Yes. Atomic was according to the standard not initializing even if you use curly braces. So I had to teach to you whenever you use curly braces, the objects are initialized unless you use an atomic object. Crazy. And uh, this, the reason we're even crazier because this was uh, the trial of future compatibility to a hopeful consistency and with uh, C in the hope they adopt some feature similar to this, which they didn't. And so we broke our whole rules uh, because of that. And by the way, we, it shouldn't even then should not have happened there. So um, this will be fixed, thankfully, in C++20. The compilers don't follow the rules. They, they are formally even not allowed to initialize. It's not undefined behavior. They are not allowed to initialize here, but they do. And uh, so we, uh, we fix that in C++20. Okay. And the final thing I want to talk about is assert. So we, we establish these rules in companies, so using brace initialization, uniform initialization, and sometimes we had asserts and we found out, oh, wait a minute, if I switch from comparing my C with the complex 0, 0, and I replace complex zero zero with curly braces, this will no longer compile because for the assertion, which is a macro, this is becoming uh, something that has two arguments. The first argument adds with the first, ends with the first zero. The second argument starts with the second zero. So please then you have to take another pair of parentheses. Summary. Okay, we fixed uniform initialization. We, uh, we fixed the mass of initialization. We made it uniform, but we had to be backward compatible, which by the way increases the mass, actually, because we still have it. So how do we fix it? Of course, we have to provide a style guide, and you have seen a little bit of the style guide I would propose. Um, I was thinking, that, uh, I was discussing this at this, a couple of companies and when I discussed it with them, we always stuck at the following uh, place when I said, look at this, you initialize that way, and you initialize a for, a, a for loop that way, why don't you change your style and make it consistent use of only using curly braces? Which means change the style you write your for, e, for loop, your traditional for loop. 
And that created interesting reactions. <laughs> ah, I feel not that very well. Mm -hmm. You know what? In the company we had done that, which is a company where I now have given, I don't know, five to 10 trainings for 200 people. Um, we got used to it to like this. I feeling now uncomfortable using the equal sign for initialization even in this case. So sometimes give it a try. That might not be approved, but we have very well experience with that to say, well, let's everywhere use curly braces now and not without an equal sign. And you have one very simple rule and not dogmatic. If it doesn't work, there are other ways to initialize and that's it. So I have provided a style guide. Um, this covers an area where Herb Sutter did some research uh, about how to consolidate, consolidate style guides and he said 5% of all style guide stuff is about initialization. So this is an important topic. Um, they are, unfortunately, they all, don't all they say the same. <laughs> That's our problem. So let's look at app science. Uniform is a stretch. That's one reason you shouldn't use it. And it's not exactly intuitive. I would claim the opposite, but okay. Interesting, I found this sentence. How much should we change our habits? I don't like it. And we don't believe the benefits outweigh the drawbacks. Okay, everybody has its own opinion. I think they're wrong. In the core guidelines, we, uh, and by the way, what they recommend in there in, instead is this. Use assignment syntax when initializing directly, and they really list all the types, literal types, smart pointers, containers, and when performing struct initialization or doing copy construction. Otherwise, use the traditional constructor syntax with parentheses. And, in, and if that does not work, use curly initialization without the equal sign. So at the third place is my recommendation. And never mix curly braces and also because then you run into this problem with the first three rules. I have a different recommendation, which by the way, fits roughly with uh, CPP core guidelines. Prefer the curly braces. And I think it's time to make this common sense in this community and to stop all the discussion about this is worse. This is far better now. This is really far better now to teach and to help people not to make many mistakes. This is not the only way for initialization. I'm talking about the default way to initialize. So make un initialization uniform for the first step. We didn't succeed in C++11. You have seen a lot of fixes that came later in C++14, 17, and some of them will come in C++20. So that's one example that in this community, as we are community driven, it's cool to provide new features. It's not that cool to provide the hard work of making it completely right so that people don't fall into traps. And it's not their fault. They are not getting paid for that. Somebody has to do the work just because they have nothing better to do. So a couple of the proposals you have seen here, I, I, I propose because I'm fed up teaching this current situation to beginners. The next thing is um, provide style guides, but we have different ones. So the next thing is consolidate the style guide and consolidate the style guides, and that's the thing we have to do right now. It will be a big task. Uniform initialization is only one example. I have a couple of other examples where at the first day of C++, I have no idea what to teach. And that's a big problem we should fix. I have no time for questions, but I'm around here. I hope you will bring this message to the community. It's really my intention that we can solve this for, forever. Thank you very much and have a nice week.